In your Bibles tonight to the book of Micah. Once again, the book of Micah tonight, our last message in the book of Micah. We've actually uh, covered the entire book, but now we're going back to look at one verse, and uh, that is verse 18 tonight, Micah chapter 7, verse 18. The Bible says, Who is a God like unto thee, that pardoneth iniquity, and passeth by the transgression of the remnant of his heritage? He retaineth not his anger forever, because he delighteth in mercy. And let's bow, please, for a word of prayer. Dear Father, we come tonight and we thank you. Thank you that you are the God whom we sing to and the God we worship, the God who is worthy of our praise and worthy of our song and worthy of our lives. We thank you, Father, that you inhabit the praises of your people. And tonight we praise you and glorify you and ask that you might guide us and direct us through the message as we look at you tonight. And uh, Father, hope, help us to see you as special and as a wonderful, gracious, loving King of kings and Lord of lords. Now, my Father, I pray that you'd open the lips of your servant to speak and the heart of every person to receive the Word of God and the things that will be shared tonight, that you might be lifted up and glorified, that your Son might be magnified, that your people might be edified and sinners might be saved, and we'll thank you for it all. In Jesus' name, amen. Micah the prophet poses a question, but it's not the first time this question has been asked in the scripture. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of the Jews, the God of the church, is the true and living creator God, and the question begs an answer that cannot fully be given. For our God is unsearchable and unfathomable in his essence and his glory and his power. The same question was asked when Israel miraculously crossed the Red Sea on dry ground by the supernatural and mighty power of God. In Exodus chapter 15, we hear this. Then sang Moses and the children of Israel this song unto the Lord, and spake, saying, Who is like unto thee, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like thee, glorious in holiness, fearful in praises, doing wonders? You see, one of the differences between God with a large capital G and the gods with a small g is that the gods never do anything. Moses said, our God is doing wonders. Remember the prophets of Baal, how they cried out all day long to their false god and cut themselves and leapt on the altar and put on that sad display trying to entice their gods to answer in some way, and yet there was no answer. And then the prophet Elijah stepped forward, spoke a few words, and the fire of God fell out of heaven and consumed the altar and burned up the altar and everything that was on it and licked up the water that was in the troughs around it. There was a demonstration that the gods with a small g do nothing. But the God of heaven and earth does wonders. Our God is not just a name. He's not just a word on a page. He has power. Power to act and power to do. Turn with me to Psalm 113. David asked this same question that we find in Micah. Psalm number 113, verse 5. The great psalmist writes this. Who is like unto the Lord our God, who dwelleth on high? who humbleth himself to behold the things that are in heaven and in the earth. David saw God as so great that God had to humble himself just to look upon the things of the heaven and the earth. This question is always followed, this question, who is like unto our God, or who is like unto our Lord, it's always followed with a list of things that God has done, that He's actually done. In Isaiah chapter 46, verse 5, He asks, To whom will ye liken me, and make me equal, and compare me, that we may be like? 
The answer, of course, is no one. There has never been anyone or anything like him, anywhere or at any time. There is no one or nothing even remotely like him. He has no equal, and there is none even in his general vicinity. You and I have peers. He has none. In Psalm 50, verse 21, God says, Thou thoughtest that I was altogether such a one as thyself. God says, don't think I'm like you, because I'm not like you. I'm so much more than you. I created you. And that's the problem with all the false gods and goddesses foisted upon mankind. For they are simply man's projections of himself. They are enlargements of mankind acting like overgrown children with overgrown lusts and faults that were spiteful and unrighteous. That's what the gods of the heathen are like. Who indeed is like unto the God, our God, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Jehovah of the Old Testament become flesh in the new? Search throughout all the writings of mankind... Look at all his myths and all his religions, his tales and his philosophies and see there is none like the true and the living God of the Bible. You can search in vain and find no equal. For all others are in reality just God made in the image of man. When we are made in the image of God. Tonight I want to look at a few things. The first one is the characteristics of false gods according to men. Now God asks the question here. He says, who is a God like unto thee? Well, the earth has many gods, and the heathen worship many gods. So we're going to take a little time to look at them tonight and see if they're like our God. There are literally thousands of false gods Actually, tens of thousands, and in some religions, even millions of gods. Remember when Paul the Apostle saw an inscription on Mars Hill, and it was dedicated to the unknown God? I guess that was the catch-all. You know, just in case we missed one, uh, we're going to put a little altar up here for the one that we we don't know about. We don't want to offend him or we don't want to offend her. We don't want to get her or him angry at us, so we'll just put it up here for them. However, I want to take some time to look at the characteristics of some of the better known false gods as well as those that are mentioned in the Bible. You know, I find it interesting that all of these gods all have avarice and wickedness. The same avarice and wickedness that human beings have. They get married... They have children. They even commit adultery, the false gods. And I want you to notice as we look at them that every last one of them is not only a sinner, but every one of them is limited. One is the God of the earth, another the God of the air, another the God of the sea. But we worship the God who created the air and the earth and the sea. They have gods of war, and each of them war with each other and deceive each other, and yet we worship the God who cannot lie. Some of these gods were half man, half beast. Some have human bodies with lizard heads, bird heads, or they have human heads with fish bodies. They have snakes for hair. They are grotesque and distorted uh, uh, fantasies of our nightmares. They are unpredictable and capricious, unstable, greedy, lusty, and full of hate, with no concern for mankind, and they act like spoiled little children. Let me share with you some of the characteristics of the false gods according to how man has created them, how man sees them. Zeus was the child of Cronus, a cruel titan. He had two other brothers, Poseidon and Hades. After he and his brothers overthrew their father... The three of them drew lots to see who would become the supreme ruler of the gods. Zeus won and reigned as the leader of the gods. He married his sister, Hera, although he is probably best known for his scandalous affairs. His weapon is the thunderbolt and he is the god of the sky. 
Now, Poseidon was the brother of Zeus. And Poseidon is the god of the sea. Hades is another brother of Zeus, and he was to rule over the dead. And it has been said that he was a very greedy god. Hera was Zeus's wife, as well as his sister. And Hera, feeling sorry for a bird, had lifted the bird up to her breast to warm it, and at that moment, Zeus, having taken advantage of surprise, assumed his normal form and raped her. The bird turned into Zeus and raped his sister, and she married him to recover her shame. Zeus was anything but faithful. His affairs were many. And Zeus fathered many mortal heroes, such as Hercules. Then there's Eris, was the son of Zeus and Hera. He was given to murderous tendencies. There was Apollo, was the son of Zeus and Leto. So you see, Zeus had a son by Hera, and then Zeus had a son by uh, Leto, who was Apollo. And Apollo was the god of the sun. Every day he would harness his golden chariot and carry the sun across the sky. He was also famous for his great oracle at Delphi, to which many Greeks came, seeking guidance and a glimpse into the future. Hephaestus was the son of Zeus and Hera, and he was lame. So now you have a god who can't walk, he's lame. I mean, this is quite a crowd, isn't it? Gilgamesh was a Mesopotamian god, and his mom, his mother, was Ninsun, a cow goddess. These are the gods of the heathen. But you know, the Bible talks about the false gods. Matter of fact, the Bible mentions a lot of false gods. The Bible speaks of the false gods of the heathen and of the religions. Turn with me to Psalm 115 and look at verse 3. Psalm 115, verse 3, God speaking about the false gods. You see, what God, the true and living God, does is He mocks the false gods of man's making. Verse 3, but our God is in the heavens. He hath done whatsoever He hath pleased. Their gods are silver and gold, the work of men's hands. They have mouths, but they speak not. Eyes have they, but they see not. They have ears, but they hear not. Noses have they, but they smell not. They have hands, but they handle not. Feet have they, but they walk not. Neither speak they through their throat. They that make them are like unto them. So is every one that trusteth in them. Amen. And so our first point was the characteristics of the gods according to men. And those were just some of the major gods. Our second point is the characteristics of false gods according to the Bible. These are the gods of man's imagination to whom they are willing to sacrifice even their own children. In Isaiah chapter 2 and verse 8, the Bible says, Their land also is full of idols. They worship the work of their own hands, that which their own fingers have made. Exodus 32.1 And when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mount, he spake... Uh, the people gathered themselves together unto Aaron and said unto him, Make us gods, which shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we wot not what has become of him. So they said to Aaron, Make us gods. Now, think for a minute. If Aaron could make a god, wouldn't that make Aaron a god? Why would they bother with gods that Aaron made when they had the maker of gods in Aaron? But that's the foolishness of idolatry, isn't it? Jeremiah 10.4, speaking of gods, it says, They deck it with silver and with gold. They fasten it with nails and with hammers that it move not. Well, we want to nail this god down so he doesn't run away. <laughs> Isaiah chapter 44 talks about all kinds of things offered to gods. And, you know, I have seen food offered to false gods and taken away, and eaten. 
You know, do they not consider, do people who worship these false gods, when they bring food to their idol and they put food in front of their idol and then they come back the next day and it's still there and they do that day after day and year after year and decade after decade, I mean, that's one hungry God, isn't it? But he never eats anything. She never eats anything. You know why? They can't. It's just a dumb idol. Look with me in Romans chapter 1 and verse 21. Romans chapter 1 verse 21. And here's the history of this thing. It says, Because that when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image, made like to corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. That's, that's what man has done. There was a time, there were two times on planet Earth when every human being on planet Earth knew the true and the living God. The first time was Adam and Eve. They were the only two people on the planet. And they knew God. The second time was the family of Noah after the flood. And everybody knew God. They knew the true and living God. But what happened? Their foolish hearts became darkened. And they started to make gods after their own image. And now we have this mess that we have today with all these different gods. There are gods of mankind's imagination. To whom we're willing to worship and sacrifice. Now, I'm not, I've, I haven't even, I'm not even going to touch on Satan and Satan worship. We're just talking about false gods. They're made like men. Psalm 50 says, These things hast thou done, and I kept silence. Thou thoughtest I was altogether such as one as thyself, but I will reprove thee and set them in order before thine eyes. God says, Your gods are just imitations. Psalm 135, 18, They make them they that make them are like unto them. Isaiah 44, 13. The carpenter stretcheth out his rule. He marketh it out with a line. He, fi he fitteth it with the planes. And he marketh it out with the compass. And maketh it after the image of a man according to the beauty of a man. Talking about the idols. And the gods of the heathen, according to the Bible, are localized. 1 Kings chapter 20, verse 23. And the servants of the king of Syria said unto him, Their gods are the gods of the hills. Now, the king of Syria is talking about... See, the king of Syria, he's looking at his, his gods, right? And he's seeing that every time they go against Israel, Israel's defeating them. And so this is the conclusion he came to. He said, well, their gods are the gods of the hills. So what we'll do is we'll fight them on the plains. Our gods are the gods of the plains. But when they fought them on the plains, they lost there too. Why? Because our God is the God of the whole earth. He doesn't, he's not localized like the heathen's gods. Acts 7 and 48, Howbeit the Most High God dwelleth not in temples made with hands. Acts 17, 24, God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that He is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands. The mistaken idea of the heathen is that you can have God dwelling in a locality. I have seen little houses around the world that the heathen have made for their little gods in their gardens and along the roadsides and in their temples. And there live their little impotent gods in those little shelters. And it's sad, isn't it? All along the road, you go, let's say you go to Japan, all along the road, little shelters where their gods are. And people will stop and worship their little god here. And then they'll go down the road and worship another little god down there and open the door and put a little food in there. I was in the largest church in the Western Hemisphere in Mexico City. And it's a dark place. You walk in there, it's dark and dreary. And they have statues of saints. And they're in glass enclosures. There's little boxes there. And the peasants, I'm talking about genuine Mexican peasants, will come in there with their little coins 
and they'll go up to the image and they'll put a coin in the box and they'll pray to the image. Then they go to the next image and they put their coin in the box. They're paying to pray to their gods. My God requires no payment. My God made the payment. Psalm 50, verse 12, God says this, If I were hungry, I would not tell thee. For the world is mine and the fullness thereof. They are an inanimate object. Psalm 115, verse 7, They have hands, but they handle not. Feet have they, but they walk not. Neither speak they through their throat. I've seen pictures, and I've personally witnessed parades where they carry their impotent gods and goddesses on platforms through the streets on their shoulders. Why? Because feet have they, but they walk not. I've seen men on their hands and knees like dogs with a great platform on their backs, carrying their lame gods who cannot walk on their own feet, carrying them inch by inch as they crawl forward. What kind of a god is this? The gods of the heathen and the false religions of the world fight and bicker with each other or they send their children or, the, or their followers with bombs strapped to themselves to go kill innocent people. What kind of God is that? There's a God that tells you to go kill your enemies, but then there's our God who says to pray for your enemies. There's a God that says go kill your enemies and a God like who is our God, the true and living God, says, go and reach your enemies with the gospel of Christ. Save your enemies. Who is like unto our God? There is no God anywhere on planet Earth that, that exists that's like unto our God. And you know what? No one counsels our God. Isaiah 40, verse 13 says, Who hath directed the Spirit of the Lord, or being his counselor has taught him? Isaiah 41, 28, For I beheld, and there was no man, even among them, and there was no counselor, that when I asked of them, could answer a word. God said, I was looking for somebody to give me some counsel, but couldn't find anybody. <laughs> Romans eleven thirty four: 34, For who hath known the mind of the Lord, or who hath been his counselor? Amen. And we have a God who answers. You know, God answered Job in Job 38, 1, 4, 34, 35. Job 39, verse 13 and 19. Job chapter 40, verse 1, 2, 6, 7, 8, 9, 12 through 14. All in that one book, that's how many times God answered Job. God answered uh, Elijah. God answers your prayers. Isn't that awesome? We're talking about the gods that we find in the Bible. There's a god in the Bible named Rimon. He's found in 2 Kings chapter 5, 18. He's the weather god. Not very very reliable, is he? (laughs) There is the god Moloch and Chion in Amos 5, verse 26, who is the Saturn god. There is Sukkoth Benoth, in 2 Kings 17.30, who is a goddess. There is Tammuz in Ezekiel 8.14, who is the vegetation god. There is Neb, Haz, and Tartak of the Arvites, in 2 Kings chapter 17, verse 31, who is the prince of darkness. There is Adrimelech and Amalek, who is the god of sun and the god of the moon, found in 2 Kings chapter 17, verse 31. Ishtar is the ancient Near East god, was an important and widely worshipped mother goddess for many Semitic peoples. The Sumerians called her Inanna, and other groups of the Near East referred to her as Ashtart. Most myths link her with the planet Venus. There's Diana in Acts chapter 19, the goddess of virginity. There's Gad, the god of Isaiah 65, 11, 
There's Jupiter, we find in Acts 14, 12, the ruler of all the other gods. There's Kalwan in Amos chapter 5, verse 26, who is possibly a star, a god of stars. There's many in Isaiah 65, 11. There's Mercury's and Hermes in Acts chapter 14, the messenger for the gods. There's Merodach in Jeremiah 5, 2, a god of war. There is Milcom in 1 Kings 11.5. There's Moloch when Molech in Leviticus chapter 20, the destroyer, the consumer of child sacrifices. There's Nebo in Isaiah 46.1 who was the god of writing, speaking, literature, and art. There is Neshutan in 2 Kings chapter 18 verse 4, the serpent god. There's Nergal, who is in 2 Kings 17.30. He's the god of war and he's the hunting god. There is Nebhaz, I already mentioned, in 2 Kings 17.31. And then there's the queen of heaven, who is Ishtar, mentioned in Jeremiah 7, Jeremiah 44. And that is the goddess of love, war, fertility. Now how can you be the goddess of love and the goddess of war at the same time? But it doesn't have to make sense. That's the problem. There's the God of Ammon in Jeremiah 46, verse 25, the sun god. There is Asherah, Judges chapter 6, the fertility goddess. There's Ashima, 2 Kings 17, 30. There's Baal, 2 Kings 18, the principal god. There is Baal Berith in Judges 8 and Judges 9. It means Lord of Covenant. There is Baal Peor in Numbers 25. There is Baal Zebub in 2 Kings 1, Lord of the Flies. It means he protects you from the flies. I think um, Off will do about this better job, don't you? There's Baal in Isaiah 46, the principal god again. There's Castor and Pollux. In Acts chapter 28, twin sons of Zeus, they were protection for sailors. There's Shemosh in 1 Kings chapter 11, the destroyer, the subduer, the one who children were sacrificed to. That's a lot of gods, all mentioned in your scripture. And God said, which one of them are like me? Which one of them is doing anything? Which one of them can talk? Which one of them can answer prayers? Which one of them can walk? God came and walked on his own feet in the person of Jesus Christ. The Bible says he walked with Adam and Eve in the garden, didn't he? It's amazing what great lengths mankind has gone to in order to avoid the true and living God. My third point is this, the unique singularity. In Isaiah 45, verse 5, God said, I am the Lord, and there's none else. There is no God beside me. Five times that phrase is given in the book of Isaiah. So God says, I am the Lord, and there's none else. I am the Lord, 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 there's none else. You get the message? Mm -hmm. I think God's trying to tell us He's the Lord, and there's none else. There's none beside me, is what He's saying. As you can see, our God is unique and different and singular in comparison to the multitude of commonness of the false gods. But since we're studying Micah, I want to, I want to close with the very thing that Micah finds so unique about the true and living God. Verse 18 again, let's go there. Micah chapter 7, verse 18. This is what Micah found to be so unique, so singular about our God. Verse 18, God, who is like who is a God like unto thee? Here it is, that pardoneth iniquity and passeth by the transgression of the remnant of his heritage. Here, he retaineth not his anger forever because 
He delighteth in mercy. If you, uh, don't do this, but studying the gods of the heathen, none of them delighted in mercy. They were bloodthirsty, and they cared not about mercy. They were bloodthirsty. They cared not about the human beings. Human beings were just chattel to them. But our God says he so loved the what? World. That he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believeth on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. You see, the false gods punish and torture, but they never forgive. They never offer eternal life. They never offer imputed righteousness. And that's because none of the false gods have ever made a payment for mankind's sin. You could search the world around and you find no God like our God who actually loved us enough to make a payment for our sin who actually cared enough about us to do something about our plight. He's unique because he alone is God. Only the true and living God has done that because he alone is the God that loves. While other gods are hating, the Lord is loving. For when, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. While other gods are evil and mean, our God is good. Luke chapter 18, verse 19. None is good save one, that is God. While other gods are dark, our God is light. And in him is no darkness at all. And our God is the only triune, three in one. You see, man could not invent that God because man cannot understand that God. So every God, apart from our God, is a God that we can understand because we made him. We crafted him in our own imagination. But the true and living God, we can't can't comprehend him. When we think of his attributes, we can't get it. Listen, you don't even understand, you cannot comprehend the concept of eternity. Our God is eternal. He says, I give unto them eternal life. We, don't, we can't get that because everything we know, everything we've experienced, everything we've been come in contact with has a beginning and an end. Yep. So when, now we, we can get an idea of what eternity means, right? But we can't, get a, we can't grasp the concept of eternity in our minds because we have nothing to compare it with. The Bible says God's all-knowing. We can't get that. God doesn't learn. We don't understand that. How can you know everything? How can you know every contingency that could ever happen? How can you know the contingency to the contingencies? See, we just kind of go... We, we, we're like that screen, you know, we freeze. We're buffering, trying to figure that out. Our God is all-powerful. And here's one, our God is everywhere at once. You see, the gods of the heathen can only be one place at a time. That's why he's the God of the sea, and he's the God of the sun, and he's the God of the hills, and he's the God of the, of the plains. And he, see, he's lo- local. Locality. They can only be one place at one time. Why? Because man, that's all man can do. Man can't figure that out. All the gods of the heathen are, are glorified human beings, twisted, demented, grotesque variations of humans. Hybrids between humans and animals. Turn with me to Genesis chapter 1. And we're almost done. Genesis chapter 1. And look with me at verse 26. 
And God said, let us. Now, how many gods are there? One. And God said, let us make man in our image. After our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. So here, he, God said, let us make man in our image. And the next verse said, God made man in his image. So the us and the our in verse 26 is the God of verse 27. The singular is the plural is the singular. That's our God. You say, I can't understand it. Yeah, that's because he's God. He's beyond our comprehension. And this is where the cults of our day get into trouble. Because they're just like the heathen that's, that invented their own gods. The cults today have invented their own Jesus. Because they can't understand how Jesus can be God and man. They, they understand he could be the son of God, but he can't be God the son. They can't understand a triunity. And so they make up their own after their own understanding. And it's a false God. The God of the Mormons is a false God. The God of the Jehovah Witnesses is a false God. The God of Scientology is a false God. And we could go on and on. The Rosicrucians and the Christian scientists and all the other ones. They're false gods. Why? Because they're not the God of the Bible. And why, why are they the way they are? Their gods are the way they are? Because that's, they made them up. And they can only make up things of which they have some kind of experience or understanding. And so we end up at Micah again. Chapter 7, verse 18. Who is, who is a God like unto thee? No one. That pardoneth iniquity? No one. Who delights in mercy? No one. Only our God. Amen. Perhaps we should take time once in a while. I would suggest take time every day to think about God and to meditate upon his attributes and his qualities and praise him and thank him Amen. for being who he is and for being what he is and for being like he is I'm just so thankful that he's the true and living God oh, amen. and I don't have to labor amen. under the fear and horror and dread of the false gods who would ask me to sacrifice my own children and it wouldn't even buy me anything it would do no good for me. Praise God that he's God. And praise God he's given us a book where he's described himself to us in the best way for us to understand him, even though with his very description, we can't fully comprehend him. Our God is an awesome God. He's the one and only, the true and the living. Let's bow for a word of prayer. As our heads are bowed and eyes are closed, sometimes we take God for granted. We don't thank Him like we should. We don't praise Him like we should. We don't adore Him like we should. We don't serve Him like, I, like we should. We don't live for Him like we should because we lose sight of who He is and what He's like. He's a God that delights in mercy, and that alone should cause us to love Him and praise Him. And maybe tonight in your own heart, dear Christian, maybe tonight you'll determine that by the grace of God and by His indwelling Holy Spirit, I want to remember to praise and glorify my God every day. I want to remember to thank Him every day. I want to remember to meditate on Him if just for a little while of how great He is. And maybe tonight you've never received this true and living God as your personal Savior. 
He is the one and only. And he was willing to come to earth and take on human flesh and die for your sins and shed his sinless blood as the payment to be buried and rise again all for you because he delights in mercy. Not by works of righteousness would we have done, the Bible says, but according to his mercy, he saves us. He'll have mercy on you tonight. He'll have pity on you tonight. He'll forgive your sin and give you the gift of eternal life if you'll ask him. Jesus said, I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. You say, preacher, I'd like to receive Christ as my Savior tonight. Would you lift your hand up? Just flip it up. Let me see it. I'm here tonight. I'm not saved, but I'd like to receive this great God, this great Savior. I'd like to receive him as my Savior. I want to accept the forgiveness that only he can bring, and I want to do it right now. Anybody like that here tonight? Father, we love you. Of course, the Bible says we love you because you first loved us. Lord, mankind has drifted so far away. We become vain in our imaginations and our foolish hearts were darkened. And we, we, we changed the true and living God into like an image. Father, forgive us as a, as a race of beings. But thank you, my Father, that you provided a Savior and you've opened our eyes to the truth of the Word of God. And thank you that we have trusted Christ as Savior and we've been born again. And the under, our understanding has been opened and we have been enlightened by the Holy Spirit who dwells within us and has saved, sealed us until the day of redemption. And thank you, my Lord, for caring about us and loving us enough to do something about our plight as sinners headed for eternity in the lake of fire. Father, that's why it's so important for us to get the gospel out so that men might see and believe on the true and living God, that you might reach them through us. Forgive us for being silent and forgive us, my Father, for being lazy when it comes to witnessing, being intimidated when it comes to soul winning. Forgive us, Father, and give us the grace and power we need that we might go forth and tell people about this true and living God that forgives sins and delights in mercy. Help us tonight, my Lord. We give you all the glory and praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand, please. We're going to sing our closing hymn. Our closing hymn tonight is number 500. All for Jesus. You know what? Jesus gave his all for you, didn't he? Are we willing to give our all for him? I'd have to say I doubt it. But what are we willing to give? You say, well, I'm not willing to give my all. You know what? Why don't you come and give what you can? Why don't you come and give yourself? Let him take care of it from there. We're going to sing number 500. If the Lord's spoken to your heart, maybe you'd like to come tonight and just praise him and thank him. You'd like to glorify him in prayer. You'd like to come and honor him with your presence on your face before him. Maybe tonight you need to know him. You need to know him personally. Why don't you come and see me? All right? If you need Christ as your Savior, you come. Otherwise, the altar's open. He's waiting for you as we sing 500. All for Jesus, all for Jesus, all my being's ransomed by. All my thoughts and words and doings, all my days and all my eyes, all for Jesus, all for Jesus, all my days and all my eyes, all for Jesus, all for Jesus, all my days and all my hours. You know, when it comes right down to it, He's all we got. Yes. How often have you told Him that? How often have you said to Him, Lord, You're all I have. If He doesn't bless, we're not blessed. If He doesn't answer, we don't have answers. 
If He doesn't give, we don't get. He's all we have, folks. How much do we love Him? How much do we praise Him? How much do we thank Him? How much do we spend time telling Him that? Maybe tonight you need to come and say, Lord, help me to remember, help me to put it in my heart that I want to spend a little time every day praising you and glorifying you. Not for what you give me, but for who you are. Not for what you've done for me, although that's awesome, but how you are and that you are. We're going to sing that second stanza. Let my hands perform His bidding. Let my feet run in His ways. Let my eyes see Jesus only. Let my lips speak forth His praise. All for Jesus, all for Jesus, let my lips speak forth his praise. All for Jesus, all for Jesus, let my lips speak forth his praise. I like that what it says, let my feet run in his ways. I think most of us are shuffling. But this hymn writer said, I want to run to get to his ways, and then I want to run in his ways. You're going to sing that last stanza. You do what God wants you to do. Oh, what wonder, how amazing, Jesus, glorious King of kings, deigns to call me beloved lets me rest beneath his wing all for Jesus all for Jesus resting now beneath his wings all for Jesus all for Jesus resting now beneath his wings Ben Riley, would you come close us in prayer, please? Let's pray. Father, thank you again, Lord, just for a powerful message. Lord, thank you for the one this morning. And Lord, just again, thank you for, for tonight, Lord. And forgive us, Lord, for, for putting things in front of you, um, putting things that we trust in more than you, Lord. As Even in the old times from the Bible till now, Lord, the, the idols that we have in our lives, the, the things that we treat more precious than you, than, than your son. And Lord, forgive us for, for um, putting anything in front of you, Lord. Help us, Father, to have a, a close walk with you, a, a love for you, Lord, that is above all. Lord, help us just to see who you truly are and the love that you have for us, Lord. Help us to share with others, Lord, the love that you bestowed on us, Lord, just by sending your son. Yeah. And Lord, for us, believing in your son for salvation, Lord, help us to, to carry that, Lord, to others and to show others, Lord, that you do, you love them, Lord, and that, that they don't need to put all the things in front of you, Lord, that, that they may be doing, Lord. And Father, forgive us, help us, Lord, and Lord, help us just to have a, a good rest of our night together, Lord, as we go out, Lord, and help us just have a good night of fellowship, Lord, with, uh, with brothers and sisters in Christ, Lord. I, I personally, Lord, just want to thank you, thank you for this church, Lord, and thank you, Lord, for what we have. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Closing one verse of 812, 812, I think we know this one.